Can you see it? Yep. Oh yeah. Whoa. Wow, that's a big picture. <laughs> this is this is Danny's world. Big prints. Lots of them. <laughs> so who's that? Oh, this is um it's a client friend of mine called Jason Lowe. Right. That's this out. shot was this out. shot was taken in um two thousand and five, I think. Now that's outside your your place in London. In Rosebury Avenue, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Danny used, well, still does actually. His brother's taken it on um, a printing studio in um, Clerkenwell in London. <laughs> and that's inkjet. No. No. The reason why I'm showing you all these pictures is got to do with our chat today, obviously. Okay. Let me show you another one. Okay, I, I think we've, we've pretty much started because it's half past, it's now 10.31 and we've got 27 people looking at your um, photos. Now that, okay, so what's that? Can you, can you see it? Tilt it a little bit so we can get the reflection. I'm going to make you speak of you for a moment and we can see that's, that's a bit more clear. Okay, so... Tell, tell us a bit about that one. Right. Let me let me walk it forward because it's relevant to our chat today. All right. There. That's a size. All right. Yeah. The reason why I make all these big prints was because a lot of people ask me the same question. How big can I go? I mean, this is a small print. <laughs> That's a small print. Yeah. So what, what size is that? Um, this is 30, 40, roughly. The other one, the other two, are 40 by 60 inches. And are those inkjet or, or a lab print? Yeah, these are, these are inkjets. Right, yeah, okay. Okay, fa fantastic. Now you're... The, the, the very you're, first one you saw there, that was shot on a six megapixel Epson RD1. Oh yes, I remember the RD1, yes, with an APS sensor. Yep. The second one I showed you, and the third one, was shot on a one inch sensor, Nikon uh, V1. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. printed as a JPEG. It's straight from a JPEG. Yeah, yeah. Your internet what is a bit jumpy, uh, Danny. I, I, um, I don't know whether anything else is going on in the background, but <clears throat> um, it's a bit jerky. But but don't worry, we'll 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 uh, we'll continue. Um, it, it, it might be me, Ian. I've, uh, my internet connection failed, and uh, um, I've got your voice, but I can't get a uh, picture anymore. Oh well, I, I can see you. Um, it's it's if if Danny's jumping around, it's more likely to be him. Uh, it's our individual connection, so but I can uh, see you perfectly. In fact, you're filling my screen at the moment. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. No, I, that's I, fine. I, can't, I can't see you and I don't know how to get back to you. Okay, so bottom left, can you see there's the microphone and the video symbol? Is your does your video symbol have a line a red line stri uh, stripe through it? Uh, I, I haven't got anything bottom left. I'm, I've still got the screen when prompted, select yes. I haven't got beyond that for some reason. Okay, try. Uh, are you using a PC? A laptop. Yeah. So try moving the mouse around. You, it might reveal uh, some some controls at the bottom. Uh, no. Uh, Andy. I don't want to hold this up. I might have to duck out of this. Is there any way you can invite me in again? Uh, just, well, just, just if you just exit the meeting and go back to the e group and click the link to enter again, you should come in. You yeah, don't need okay. to be invited again. Just go back to the e group, click the link, and you should come through the entry yeah. process again. And I'll watch out for you in the waiting room. And, and uh, oh, is there is the waiting room on, or have you just let everyone in? Because I didn't let anyone in. 
Um, in case you haven't got the waiting room on. Yeah. So no, you yeah. just let everyone in. Yes, okay. So Peter, try that and we'll see you again in a few seconds. Right, I did try that and uh, it just comes through to download and run Zoom. That's as far as I can get. Well, you, you're still there. So you didn't, you obviously didn't close the connection down in the first place. You actually have. Mm. Yeah. I think you just switched your camera off or uh, no, switched the the view off. Um, Ian, if I could, could add at this point, if you iconize your Zoom window, it, um, unless you change the default setting, it iconizes to the system tray thing and not the bottom bar. Um, I managed this by mistake and had trouble getting back. You actually have to click on um, the, the, the little up arrow to the right on your bottom bar and it might then show a zoom icon which you can click to get back to everything. What, so, I'm, going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close down completely and try to get right back in from scratch. I think that's probably the best thing um, because you can't see the bar at the bottom at all, can you? No. No. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. So, suddenly I have you. Oh, excellent. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly I have you. Brilliant. Okay. Well, let, let, let's make a formal start now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of background information about Danny. Um, so first of all, Danny is located in Hong Kong and he's been, you've been there now for uh, nearly 10 years, haven't you? Oh, Danny's, Danny's muted, but Danny, you've been there for nearly 10 um, years. Uh, I moved here 2006. It's almost four, 14, 14. I can't believe that. It seems just like yesterday. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. So, but Danny actually came over to the UK uh, as, a, as a toddler, basically, weren't you? You were a small child. Uh, I was 10 when I, when I yeah. moved, when okay. I not, not, you know, not, immigrated. Not quite a toddler. And, and your family eventually settled for a while in Sunderland. And, That's right. And it, it was a typical scenario. You, your mum and dad ran a Chinese restaurant. You moved to London, and when I was working in Haringey uh, at a camera store that I managed back in the late 80s, you lived just down the road, and you used to pop in and rummage around in the shop, and uh, I found out that you were uh, uh, developing your skills as a, as a art from a printer, and enjoying your mum and dad's cooking at the same time. <laughs> And then all yeah, my friends... I, mean, I, I studied photography in Newcastle. Right. Um, I passed my uh, sitting guilds and Northern Diploma. Um, we, we, we moved to London because there was a recession up, up in the north um, where the steel works and shipyards were closed. Yeah. And we got no choice but to um, you know, move to yes, London. Sir. Yeah. So... So the, the story starts that um, Danny and I were just basically friends through, through the fact that I, I was working. Um, I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I, I never intended to work in a camera shop, but uh, for various reasons after, after university, that was the first job that I had. And um, Danny and I just became like, uh, you know, stepbrothers. You know, it was, it was, it was just something which was, very personal. We we always we could always talk the hind legs off a donkey, you know, whenever we met. And most of my friends got to know him really well. And uh, uh, but the story went on and on and on. So Danny developed his business. He became, you know, he was just a he was a master at black and white darkroom printing. So he had clients like you had the British Library, I think. Um, um, I was I was subcontracted by the Halton Picture Library. Yeah, which was owned by the BBC at the time. Yeah, and then from there on, I started my own darkroom. My client list includes the um, the National Portrait Gallery, the Photographers Gallery, Magnum. Yeah, you know before before the photojournalism died anyway. I basically I print for the Fleet Street. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and so 
basically I can, re I can remember your service desk. People were coming in with rolls of film and they were, they were collecting uh, uh, archival and studio prints. Well, all I, was the only, I was the only darkroom, um, pure black and white darkroom, that were able to offer a four hour turnaround developing and processing yeah. and contacts in yeah. four hours. And because I, I, um, I have to say I that, the, that was the time when I really worried about your health because you spent 18 hours a day in the darkroom with all the chemicals and you never saw the light of day. Your, your skin was white. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in, in a way, digit, the arrival of digital kind of saved your life because although it, it, it threatened your business overnight because of, obviously the darkroom business was killed off by digital, you, yes. had already, you had already foreseen what was going to happen and you spent a I lot think of time... I, I think I just got lucky. I, yeah, I, you know, no one can foresee what the world's going to be, but, you know, I, I believe that we are just a product of, uh, of the character that we play, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. I have no idea why I, has, why I have such a love for computers and for digital yeah. imaging. I mean, that, that was one of the things that we both had uh, a mutual interest in because in the, uh, well, actually it was the mid eighties, wasn't it? So in the mid eighties, the home computer boom had started. And in fact, that's what I went on to do next after working in, in, in the retail. Uh, federal well, retail business. I remember we were talking over a 96, 9,600 board rate when you're working for Prestel. No, no, it wasn't even as fast as that. Uh, originally, it was 1,200 by 75 bits right. per second. <laughs> Just think now, I have a 200 megabit connection, and you, you, your building has a, a one gigabit connection, doesn't it? So, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but basically, I, I like to allow myself a little, a little bit of credit because we, we, we both kind of encouraged each other. You encouraged my photography, and I encouraged your computer interest and and because of that you were prepared you, you'd already done a lot of messing around with digital imaging when the when the digital imaging boom happened and so you were able to jump straight in nobody yeah else... i was on that aspect i was years ahead of the pack as it were yeah um it was back in um i believe it was in uh, night Around right about 1997, when customers start asking about, you know, scanning and retouching, that's even before the, uh, the whole of the industry moved over. It's about 96. Yeah. 96, yeah. yeah. 96, 97. And at that time, retouch station cost between a quarter of a million pound to a million pound. Um, but I was working with a, a homebrew, homemade um, PC workstation, which costs um, around about fifty thousand pounds. That's still um, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, but it's not as not as much as a you know, you know, quarter of a million. Um, I was able to charge people eighty pound an hour instead of five hundred pound an hour around that, around that time for retouching. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I was gradually just, just be, you know, out of interest. And people just say, I wish I can retouch this or retouch that. And I said, look, you know, give me a try. And they were, they were giving me files. And basically, that's how, I, that's, that's how I got started. And so by the time when um, John Tarrant of, of BJP, British Journal of Photography, found out you know, um, about me, that was through the uh, Association of Photographers. Um, there was an annual competition. Um, me and another photographer called Ben Wood, we entered some um, A3 plus prints and we won that category. I think it's still live category. Uh, I think it was 1997. And there wasn't even a name um, for retouching or printing. So they credit me as a system operator. 
And that's when John, he, uh, he, he rang me up. He said, how the hell do you actually learn digital? Because around that time, only very big labs can afford to have a, a retouch station or retoucher in-house. But I was all, already then offering the, uh, the service. So you, you basically found a niche in the market. And uh, I, I had a kind of similar exp uh, experience because uh, I was an IT journalist by, by that time, but I got approached by lots of photo photography magazines who had nobody who knew anything about digital imaging. And of course they needed to write articles about ca digital cameras and things like that. So we, we both had a similar kind of experience that digital imaging became a new life for us. And uh, yeah. um, so, I mean, just, just, to, just to hasten on the, the introduction, um, uh, you, you were a master black and white printer in the darkroom, and then you became an expert in digital imaging and uh, digital printing. And what, one, uh, and you started off being a specialist in printing black and white from digital. Uh, and again, this was another black art, wasn't it? Uh, uh, um, because Getting, I, I don't know whether anybody else here has tried to print black and white on, on an inkjet printer, but it's very difficult to make that print look like a black and white print, uh, a conventional print, the deep silver blacks, uh, the silver oxide blacks. And, um, um, but Danny was one of the first to realize that by color managing your system, uh, not, not, not just the screen, but the printer as well, using profiles um, and selecting the right kind of inks and the right kind of papers, you could then create uh, uh, inkjet prints which were almost indistinguishable from um, black and white darkroom prints. And uh, they're, they were able to, even under different lighting conditions, um, uh, there's, there's that very technical word that, that we used to talk about a lot, mesomerism. Uh, where even if you've got um, a black and white print which looks great at first, if you then change the lighting, suddenly it starts to look like a, you can see its color. Uh, but if you get it absolutely right, then this black and white print uh, will look black and white no matter how, how you illuminate it. Um, well, it's down to the new um, ink formulation now. In the, the, the very first generation of pigment inks, there was a lot of um, metamerism or metamerism, depending on how you're going to pronounce it. Um, it was from the second generation and third generation, which they more or less ironed out that shift between daylight and, you know, um, tungsten or fluorescent light. Yeah. So. Um, Actually, Henry from Kuala Lumpur, are you still there? I can't see you on my screen. Yeah. Okay. Henry has a question about profiles, haven't you? Right, you need to put your microphone on. Okay. No, no, I'm not on uh, profiles. Well, actually, it may not be my direct question because I did ask before uh, is that uh, I've got the spider on my screen and I have got it calibrated. Then I've got the spider uh, print and I still can't get anything right between what I see and what I print. Maybe oh, it's is because I'm using it wrong or I could have been, I'm doing something that's not correct. Well, th th What's this, your advice? This, this was Danny's bread and butter for many years. Um, <laughs> he, he was able to get other, obviously eventually other people started doing their own printing. And uh, so uh, his exclusivity wasn't there anymore, but he then found an, a, a, another niche was, uh, he had all the expensive equipment to do color profiling for, for people's setups. So people would um, get their printers profiled. Uh, they would print out uh, test, um, test sheets and he would then analyze them and then provide them with the uh, the file with uh, the ICC or I ICM file 
to to properly set up their their their, their printer. So 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 Danny, um, do you think you can help Henry? Yes. First of all, obviously, I think the equipment that you calibrate your monitor with is very important. And one of the most important calibration for the monitor, um, forget about laptops, I'm talking about a really nice IPS twist, you know, monitor where you got good color depth and, um, you know, bit rates. And on top of that, you, most of the uh, calibrating, calibration software would ask you to use I think brightness of 120 or 140, but I, I, I set up mine on 80. That is below the CRT recommended of uh, 100 brightness. It's because you got the back screen <clears throat> uh, LED, but your print is reflective according to your, your incoming uh. light. So your, your viewing condition has to match I remember when I first did color management, the very first customer I supplied the profile to, he called me up and he said, hey, Danny, your, prof your profile is shit. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. And, and he was, uh, he basically, after when I finished work one day, and I said, I I'll come up to your, you know, to your, to your place and to see what happened. I went into his room. He was working in a completely black room with a tungsten bulb. Now, you know, you know, when you calibrate your screen to 5,500 Kelvin, but you view it with a 3,300 or 3,400 or 3,000 Kelvin bulb, obviously there's going to be a massive difference, isn't there? Mm. So, <clears throat> Every step of the way, you have to tell people from the calibration of the software all the way to the viewing condition, it has to match. Um, but no matter what you do, I mean, I used to have a showroom where I have a 4,000 Kelvin-like source, 5,500 Kelvin-like source, just to <clears throat> show the print against the screen. But in an ideal, you know, that's in the ideal viewing condition, but you realize most of the homes and galleries, they have so very temperatures. I mean, your normal daylight is 5,005 to 6,000 Kelvin and overcast can easily be go to 9,000 Kelvin, which is very blue. <clears throat> yeah. And your indoor, you know, now, I mean, I got, um, I got now LED lights, and they're very stable, around about, you know, 5,005, 5,006. 5, but if you having a, <clears throat> a, even a, a color rated um, fluorescent tube is only good for about, for, for about five to six months before they start to shift drastically. So under those circumstances, I no longer do that anymore. And I basically, if people want the, the perfect condition, they need to get a test print and judge on the print and not from the monitor because the, the color space on the monitor, they vary. They're not the same as the color space as the paper profile or the Adobe 1998. The monitor, monitor color space can't see some of the, the colors that the printer can print out. Can you see the difficulties here? Yeah. I'll let you get that. So, okay. Does that, right. help, does that help Henry? Now, so for, for Henry, um, first of all, I think you need to change your color spider to a more accurate, if you're gonna make your uh, screen profile, but you still need to do your paper profile, that means you need a, a more accurate and better software. And I think x right which they, 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 they bought a the technology from Greta Macbeth and they still have the best technology for the, for the best black and white, um, you know, profiling. And the larger the, the chart, I mean, if you do over a thousand patches, then you get a much more linear, you can pull all the CMYK inks 
into a much more linear line than if you've got a, a cheap, you know, two, three hundred patch profile. So you can you can make your own profile, but your equipment and the number of patches can you know can cause a lot to your final quality. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks. I think I got it. <laughs> it, um, it, it does sound. Yeah, I was going to say it does sound like you, you need to make sure that your screen is not too bright, and that you need to try profiling your screen again. If you if you do printing, I suggest you you set it to eighty on the brightness right. instead of a hundred okay. or hundred and twenty. Okay. Okay. Now, Henry did not, have one other really. brief question, uh, which was about DPI and PPI in, in, in the camera. Uh, I, in the I, camera. Yeah. yeah. So, my, I think I explained it correctly, but basically DPI or PPI settings in the camera are almost irrelevant when it comes to printing because you're, you're sizing the print according to um, the paper size and the pixels will just fit. Um, according to how you, you set the output. So I'm not really sure what the relevance is of DPI settings in the camera. What, what, what do you think, Danny? Well, DPI for me only works with, you know, dot gain. If you, if you actually in a printing press business, when it comes to dithering in inkjet printing, the only thing you need to care for is depending on the, 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 the print head resolution that you're using. Say for instance, Epson, I mean, my, my latest printer, the, um, the, P2, the P20,000, which is a 64 inch printer, it has a native DPI of 2,400 by 1,200. The last generation has got a native of 2,880. Right now, people don't realize this. Um, I've been printing with a rasterized image processor, a commercial. It's it's called a RIP software, and had a you know it has a much better um, algorithm engine built in. I mean, I pay eight grand in terms of pounds for this software to run my three machines. Okay, and you you say. Wow, why pay so much? Now, from the days before I used the, uh, the RIP software, you'd be lucky to get a six megapixel of print up to A2 without seeing the jaggies, right? And also, I, um, there was, I learned from, from mistakes. There was a customer, she wanted 90 centimeters square print, and by the time when I did everything and she got a print, I didn't measure it. She came back and she said, it measures, you know, uh, 90 on one side, but was 89.5 on the other, right? So what caused that? And um, obviously, you know, I'm a perfectionist in a way. So you know what I found out? It was, I never set the, the print DPI. I just left it, whatever it is, and just bung it through the system. Now, on a desktop printer driver, if your printer have a native 1440 or 2880, ideally, you should set it to either 240, 360, or 180, depending on the, the, the size of print you're gonna print. That means, if you divide that into your printer resolution, you should end up with a zero at the yeah, end. Yeah, it's a multiple, yeah. Right? So the calculation will be perfect. Now, with a RIP, you don't need to worry about that. I can bang in 10 different images with different resolution. The RIP will sort it out for me, even on the same page. And, and that still holds true, even for today's desktop printers. So, you know, people... I mean, and also I've tried printing at 300 DPI, 600 DPI, 900, 900 DPI, you know, in the old days. Once you pass 300, 
you won't see the quality in in the desktop rip software okay the that's the, the, the desktop driver so the only thing you can improve your your prints now is at 100 percent you know after you do your sharpening is your resolution make sure you interpolate or change the resolution to depending on you know the the, the, the the size print you're printing either 180 240 or 360 for the epson print heads and if you got the uh, hp print heads i think they're based on 300 dpi 600 dpi 1200 1200 dpi or 2004 and you have to set it to 150 or 300 does that make sense i henry no i, I think I, I i have a feeling that we're going to need some kind of printing <laughs> printing session <laughs> because this is getting very deep but um but that oh, is pretty simple to me <laughs> well all right uh and to me, because I, I've done a lot of it myself, but, but I can imagine that for a lot of people, um, some of whom may be listening in, um, that's pretty deep. Um, but one, one thing is pretty clear is that not many people print anymore. Um, right. uh, now, I did have a question from somebody uh, who was sending, wanted to know how... To Ian, sorry, yes. while you're thinking of that, I'm just going to comment on that you you were talking about the PPI in the in the camera. Um, nobody here will get this wrong, but I have seen it get spectacularly wrong when you drag an image into PowerPoint and you've got a high PPI set in your camera. You get a nice small picture. So I went to an event where somebody was showing a, a slideshow, and they resized up all their images because PowerPoint had put a small picture in the middle of the screen so they 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 doubled and trebled the size of their images so their powerpoint presentation was about four gigabytes and uh, it wouldn't run it wouldn't run on the laptop that was provided and i ended up sitting at the back resizing all their images down and then changing the pp the, the dpi and sucking them into a new powerpoint presentation on my laptop uh, so people can get it spectacularly wrong <laughs> yeah absolutely uh, um, obviously, when, when you put uh, an image into Photoshop and you resize it and things like that, then I suppose you, you can change the, the DPI, PPI. In fact, there's DPI and PPI. So D DPI is really about printing. Um, and I think, it, as you said, it originated with um, uh, printing presses, didn't it? Um, but pix there's a dots per inch, which is the printed dots per inch. And then there's the printed pixels per inch, which is PPI. They are different. Ian, can I just interject there? The, the main reason for the thing on the camera is because it, most cameras have the, the ability to do direct print, so you can plug your printer directly in, which I wouldn't recommend. No. Um, so if that is more about for when you're doing that kind of direct printing. Um, Frankly, it doesn't matter a, a bean if you're importing uh, and then doing even the most rudimentary processing. Yeah. And of course, if you're doing uh, raw process, uh, raw photos all the time, it, it, it's even less important. It, you know, it's it's the same thing with with raw. People get worried about should I set Adobe RGB or uh, sRGB? Well, actually, it makes no difference because it's raw. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you, you get those sort of things. The other thing I just wanted to quickly uh, touch on was, um, Danny was talking about um, the software. You don't need to go completely to the eight grand mark. The basic software you have with um, a lot of these calibration tools is not terribly good. And it's about interpolation, you know. Yes, you've got so many patches, but how do you, how do you work out the colors in between? Um, and there are much better pieces of software, many of which are freeware, that will interpolate a lot better and, you know, are very extensible for the number of patches and the target you're putting to. Um, the thing I would say, though, is they're not very user-friendly. No. So if you're, if you're not an IT native, if you're not very IT-capable, 
I wouldn't recommend that. No. And Danny's been through all the pain of learning all that, haven't you? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't happy with, you know, what you see, what you don't get. So, yeah, I went through, I went through and, and, and taught myself color management. And then eventually I become an agent for Greta Macbeth and actually went to the, the classes and um, become self-sufficient. So for, for around about five years in London, I was a color management consultant as well. And you used to teach Epson staff how to use their printers and things, <laughs> things like that. Now, they're I'm, engineers and sales. They, they, they're not printers. That's why. No, no, that's true. Now, do, things are very technical at the moment. I do want to move on to the more anecdotal side of things in, in future. So uh, let's get a few more technical questions sorted out and then we can go back to being a bit, a bit more, more relaxed. Now, uh, Duncan, uh, is Duncan here with us today? I can't see any. Duncan is Wanderer on, on, on the site. Everyone uh, is probably familiar with him. But Duncan sent me a, a message, which I think I, I relayed to you. He was asking about, um, uh, I'll read it out. Can, can you ask him about basic settings for quality prints, how to control noise and masking, if that's relevant? My knowledge of printing is very limited, but I have a friend in Glasgow whose prints scream sharp, and I'd like to know how he does it. I'm tolerably happy with one or two prints I have, I've done. I think he uses some service called Deadly Digital, but I'm not very familiar with that. But I'd like to know what to give the printer as a starter to get the best quality. Um, and he's actually provided a, a link. I don't know whether you managed to, to. Yeah, but 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 those the very small, um, the very small sizes I can't really see no, properly. Okay. Um, I mean, does he want to print himself or send it elsewhere to get printed? I, I think he he is using um, a third party printer, but he hasn't been very satisfied with the prints he's been getting, uh, or at least not compared to his friend so he, right. he's basically looking for tips as to how to prepare an image to be printed because i i think he's assuming that a print that looks good on the screen may not necessarily print well now i think this comes back to screen well doesn't it i think you need to find a a printer that works with customized profiles and that means the result is consistent from time to time. Um, if you, you know, you can, you can, you can do this. It's almost like the same time when I was in London before the digital era. I used to do a lot of copy negative for the for the BBC Hilton, Hilton Picture Library. Um, I did. Um, I shot a lot of five four um, color transparencies at that time. I sent it out in two different batches. Um, one was to Metro, one was to Joe's Basement. Um, the other one went to, there's a, there's a lab called Lancaster, and then there's one called Keishi. These are, these are around that time, the four kind of top professional processing labs. And about, you know, after I had the first batch back, and I waited for another week, send a second batch off. And then I, I average and see which lab has the best color, you know, process control. Um, and then you realize it's only those labs or, you know, print houses where they have a, can able to give you consistent print. Mm. Yeah. That's the one that's worth going back to. I mean, some of them can vary so much, you wouldn't believe that yeah. is exactly the same, same sheet of film. Yeah. You know, shot in the same condition. Okay. Um, I've got another question here. Um, this is from um, William. Uh, he's on the forum as Hair Bill. <laughs> um, he's asking about profiles again. So uh, he says, it's generally recommended to use dedicated ICC as the profiles as, they, as these profiles give you the best results. My experience has been that there is a very little difference between dedicated and generic ICC profiles. Ooh, what is your experience? 
Well, Red in the old the days, <laughs> yeah, in the older days, the um, the printhead QC control is not as good as the present day. So <clears throat> the CAN profiles, you know, many years ago, they can vary drastically. Of course, that's much better now. But there's still a chance that the, that the CAN profile can vary. I mean, he's been lucky. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, uh, actually, Andy's been, uh, and Andy, Andy Elliott, who, um, in fact, Andy, has your account on the forum lapsed? Because um, I don't think you were aware of the chat until I, I messaged you. But, but Andy's quite famous on the forum for um, bird photography. Um, and we used to do some um, meets with, with, with Andy up in uh, Cambridgeshire, Norfolk. So um, uh, Andy's asked, a, well, basically made a comment. Um, and he says he's used um, printers with just black inks. Or, or black and gray inks, I presume. Is that right, Andy? Yes, that's correct. So basically you're taking the, the, the pack of cartridges that you have in your Epson printer uh, with a, and then use one of these sort of continuous feed systems um, where, you, where you're actually got reservoirs that are not in those cartridges. But then you end up with a range of different grays and blacks rather than colors. And obviously you need to use a, a dedicated profile to do that. Um, but you get a much better depth of color and gradation of color than you'd get if you were just using the standard cartridges. Is so, that the, uh, the cone, the cone uh, black and whites? So I'm a bit confused. You, you, you're talking about black and white, uh, black inks, but color. No, no, no. So you, you replace your color, your, you, you know, typically you might have like seven cartridges. Yeah, you might have um, yeah. uh, a couple of blacks and um, a, a bunch of colors. Um, well, instead, you replace all of those cartridges and there are different, there's a different range of grays and blacks. So you've got s seven different grays and blacks as opposed to just two or three. Um, so that when the uh, the printer's got more options, if, if you will, when it's actually doing the printing to get this finer gradation of, of greys and blacks. Does that make sense? Yes. It's, it's called the, uh, I think, you know, there's this one company has been around for many years called Cone Inks. I don't know which system it was I was using, but yeah. HP used to do uh, replacement print cartridges. You used to just pop the color print cartridge out and pop the black and white print print cartridge in, and and had exactly what you said uh, on some of the older HP printers I used to use. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know there there are people who use. It's it's, it's called John Cone inks. If you actually you know, if you just search the web, you can you can buy them. There are, there are people selling those inks. I wouldn't recommend it and I wouldn't use it because um, the third party inks, even, even though they're now are, are getting better, but like, like you said, like Andy said, that you need to have a special profile. And another thing that I, um, I know what I can do with full, you know, I don't just print with the gray inks, although all Epson printer come with a standard driver, you can actually print just with the blacks and, and, and grays. The new, the new printer now has um, matte black, photo black, light black, light light black, and a light gray. So basically they got four blacks, but I still use a full range because I tend to tone my black and white prints with individual settings. Like I put one yellow on a highlight Two yellow in a mid tone, two yellow in a, sh in a shadow, one red in a shadow, and one red in the mid tone, just to, to to get me off the cool neutral black. When I use all the all you know all the color inks, I print all my black and white in RGB. <clears throat> and the latest um, printers now, the D Max is really really nice. And if I really want even a better black then 
I had um, I got a new uh, Hewlett Packard Z9 that got even better uh, black density ink than the Epson. But that printer is um, is is not as friendly in terms of use, you know, when it compared to the Epson. If I if I really want to tweak, you know, really really good black and whites, and in fact I've actually compared to some print with that black and white ink system that someone that I know here use, and I can say my prints are much better, and I got far better color control than he can on those ink sets. Okay. So, and commercially suicide anyway because. <clears throat> The head can can block quite easily um, because the you know these head that we use on the, you know the, the Epson heads they're very very expensive. This is run about on my new printer, which is less than three years old. I had three head changes already, and it's two thousand pound a pop. That, that's yeah. the world of professional printing. Um, <laughs> I have got a question here from um, Ralph Bennett, um, who uses a Canon Pro 1000 printer. Now, yeah. I'm not familiar with that printer, but um, uh, I'm a bit out of date with printers, actually. I need to get back into that. But um, It's a nice printer. He's, he's asking what the native, um, uh, I think he's talking about the native uh, DPI, PPI setting would be for that printer. Um, well, I don't know the spec of that one, no. but look up the native DPI and just divide that, you know, in, you know, so if you, if it's the, the printer is, um, say 2,880, if you divide that by 360 or 180 and you will get a, a, a number, basically I think it's 4.0. As long as you, you don't go into fractions. Yeah, as long as there's no remainder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Paul Graeber has been talking. Uh, he's, I think he's been talking about different print services. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's Aspect 2i, Paul Gallagher, and Michael Pilkington. Uh, and, and they run Epson print workshops as well. Um, so okay there's there's various comments there and um okay so let let's move on then let's let's talk a bit more about photography in 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 general now one of the fascinating things about your career danny has been the people you've worked with and there are one or two notables um the late Bob Carlos Clark was somebody who you did a lot of work for and still do. Um, who here is familiar, familiar with Bob Carlos Clark? Does, okay, because he, he, his, his photography was uh, quite outlandish, wasn't it? Um, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite challenging uh, on the eye. <laughs> um, but- um, You mean that it's a feast to the eye? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, it, it depends on, on, on what you're interested in, I, I, I suppose. But that, um, but uh, now he, he, he mainly did or exclusively did black and white, didn't he? Uh, yes. Yeah. Now you, sadly, he took his own life, didn't he? Um, he was, uh, he had mental health issues, but his, his work was generally regarded as, as quite brilliant. And you had the privilege of, of working for him. C can you tell me a little bit about his work? Well, the, the time when I worked, you know, with him was when he need retouching. Um, there are a number of pictures that uh, they weren't quite perfect on the figure. And, uh, and some of them, he, he, he needs certain things removed, uh, like the platform. Um, one of the picture that I, I just thinking out of my, I try to remember the name of the, uh, the model standing on the, on, on a, on a platform and I am to remove the stool 
and place it with a round disc and which she couldn't do at a time. And obviously, on top of that, I, I tweaked all his files to a much more, um, you know, with, 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 with better depth, sharpness, because in the printing, what people don't realize is that we need to increase the shadow just in the, sha in, in the shadow area, increase the contrast in the shadow to, to push the, the blacks slightly deeper without losing the details. Now, how many of you actually working with Photoshop or just working with Lightroom? Because um, I, I have a little trick that I've been using for years and a lot of people find it's very useful is if in Photoshop you can select um, highlight how many of people you know know how to do this is this you press histogram uh, control alt um, and you on the keyboard you, you press either three four or five to select mid-tone and the different variations in the highlights you can try that um, I work with um, Mac, so it's Control Alt. I, I sometimes I select three for mid tone, five for the highlights, or four somewhere in between. Once I got that, I invert it, invert the selection, then I uh, Command J to create another layer and change the uh, the mode into. Um, what's the uh, hold on one minute? Yeah, into highlight. Um, basically, you in, you you increase the contrast on that layer, but you don't use all of it, depending on the density. So you need need to use your eyes mm. to see. If you try that, you will, you will see, maybe I, I, do, um, I do a file and send it over to you. You can post yeah. it up. That, that, that would be really good. Maybe a before yeah. and after. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, a lot of people don't look at the histogram when they print. And half the time, when you see the histogram, the histogram is somewhere like this mm. or, or with the highlight or push on one side. And the black are nowhere near black and also when you if you print with a profile you should set to um check the the black point compensation because right. by by checking the black point you're basically asking the printer to check where the black point is and use the the, the darkest black within the uh the histogram as the darkest black i i, I mean personally I, I i don't know about uh everyone else but I've noticed a tendency recently, both on on video and and on in in some prints of imagery which has no blacks and uh, oh, people people do that deliberately yeah. for the styling. That's okay. I, it's okay, but yeah, I don't know. I, I like a good black. Uh, I like contrast personally, but that's that's me. Yeah. Well, you can't apply the same rule to everything, no. so. When I work with different clients, um, I generally ask them to see the rest of their work so I know, you know, the kind of thing that they're looking at. So I it, engage. In the end, it's yeah. what they want, isn't it? it? It's their creativity that you need to... Uh, well, I apply my knowledge to improve it even better. Hmm. That's my job. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm good at everything, but... I know I can improve what a, whatever file you've thrown at me. Yeah. The print that I make. Uh, do you have any other interesting anecdotes about um, photographers that we may have heard of um, uh, w when you've worked for them? <laughs> He's thinking. <laughs> I don't know where to start. I mean, I honestly, I mean, I work with so many people. 
were, were, were there any funny, funny incidents at your studio? Well, I, I remember that. Have you heard of, um, there's, there's an artist, the late artist called Michael Wolf. No, but uh, anyway, go on. Well, he is quite well known within the fine art field. Go on. Oh, I just heard, I, th I thought someone is talking. No, I, I think that was just something else. And, um, well, with me is I look at what I do as a hobby <laughs> rather than as a job. So he was introduced to me by another, you know, um, artist. And in our first meeting, um, we just talked about spirituality because you know, he was talking about another photographer copying his work. And in my eyes, he's already quite successful because I just literally just bought three of his books for my own personal, you know, um, because I, I, I like the work that he did. And by the time when we met and, and he was quite um, protective, you know, towards his work. And um, instead, I just, we just talked about spirit, you know, spirituality for like two hours. We didn't get into business. <laughs> and we became the best of friends after that. Right. That's good. So yeah, because when he, when he introduced me to another um, a director in the Girth Institute in Hong Kong, the first thing he said was, you know, that we, we had a meeting, our first meeting, we just talked about spirituality. You know, that was the, the thing that he still remembers. It's interesting how certain things will connect people and those, those connections can be, can be long lasting. So um, um, does anyone have a question for, for, for Danny based on what we've been hearing to get today? Does anyone want to speak up? Nope, they're all listening rather than wanting to talk. Um, Sorry, Ian, I, I... I've, I've got a question ab ab about this, th this thing about blacks and, uh, and, and dynamic range and how to cope with it. Okay. Um, I've tried on occasions to print on a Japanese paper by a company called Awagami, um, which is a, a washi paper. And obviously that doesn't have the dynamic range. You're never going to get the blacks on that. Should one adjust the histogram to account for that or should one just still get the get the, the full dynamic range and let it fall where it may on the um, on on the print? In other words, how should one adjust for that? Well, I think you need to do um, because it's only if the one. I mean, the paper that I've used, one of the most textured paper of washi paper, is only fifty-five grams, so it 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 can't absorb a lot of black ink. So what you need to do, you need to do a, like a, a density chart and work out, if, you know, it's like a, you know, a little block at a time. So like an old test print on a... On, on a yeah, new exactly, yeah. exactly the same and see how much ink it can absorb. I mean, on thin paper, uh, on my rib, I normally having to set sometimes the ink limit instead of 100, I had to set it to run about 70 because, you know, if, if you flood the paper with ink, all you get is just, you know, just wavy black. It cannot ever dry flat. Yeah. And can, can, I, can I set that level of, uh, that, that, that level, I mean, you're obviously with using RIP software, you can set the level of the, 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 those levels, but you can't within Lightroom of, of Photoshop or can you? You may be able to do it on a driver, and if you can't do that, then you may have to do it on the file. You have to limit your ink on the file. Okay, so you use a use a grey rather than a deep black in yes. the actual file. Yeah. Yes, and you may you you may need to modify your your black as it were. Yeah. To to suit the paper. Okay. Thanks very much.
No, you're welcome. It, is this something? And, all, and also make sure that on the highlight, I always, I never, uh, you know, I always have, um, I always print my highlight right about 250. Some, check your histogram. Yeah. On the right hand side of your, of, you know, on the highlight, oh. if you go off the charts, go on to the input in your, on, on the levels, instead of 255, bring that back into 251. Yeah. So even if you've got a white edge, that will print out as a, as a, as a gray, just 1% gray. Okay, so that, that, that limits just the, um, the range of the, actual, of the actual image rather than to, 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 to work with the, the paper rather than just print, print the image. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like burning in in the highlights. Yeah. I'm, I remember in the old days, I'm the one, as, you know, I'm, I'm the one that constantly used flashing the um, photographic paper. Yeah. You know, when you got... You know, the the, the 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 sky is all blanked out, and sometimes when you you can you can try to expose it, it wouldn't work very well. So what I've done is I I used to have a a Vivitar two eight three flash gun. Oh yeah, I remember those. With, with a card in front of it, with you know basically it's a it's an exposed um, photographic paper. It's all black. I tape in front of it. And I've, I've done a lot of tests until I got it right. So I literally hold it, you know, and then flash the paper, which is already in the easel. And then I expose on top of it. Yeah. And by, by using the 251 on the level, that basically is a flashing for the paper. So imagine you print with a border, you never get bleeding yeah. out of it. And so you reduce the contrast, which was what the, the point of flashing was in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. you, you get, you get a, 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 you know, at the faint line. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> You're welcome. So I, I have a, a simple yeah. question about preparing images for sharpness before printing. Um, I read a lot about uh, images need to be over sharpened to print them compared with what you see on the screen. In other words, when you, you prepare an image on the screen and get it to what you, what you like, you then should sharpen it a bit more before you actually print it. Now, it, the extra it, printing, it, should it be just on the detail or is it for the whole image that needs to be extra sharpened? It will depending. You see, sharpening is something that is so personal. Um, Sometimes, to be honest with you, um, I don't ever sharpen the images that I print. For me, uh, a good print is something that you feel you want to get involved with. Now, sometimes you see a, you print and say, wow, that's sharp. It's razor sharp. It stops you going into the picture. The way I print, I tend to print more organic because I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm from the old, old school film school. So I don't use, I don't use unsharp mask at all. If I ever need to use sharpening, I use the um, high pass filters. Anyone knows how to use that? I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure. You just use a very small percentage of uh, a contrast in the shadow area, but you, 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 you can't overdo that neither because it can cause like, uh, you know, like a, a white edge if you, if you overdo it. Yeah, well, I, I use Topaz plugins uh, with, with uh, Photoshop quite a lot, uh, particularly the, the detail plugin that I find quite useful because you can, you can increase detail uh, in various parts of an image quite nicely with that. Uh, yes, the Topaz are, are very good software, but again, depending on the system that you use, and don't ever over sharpen, because if you look at a, a good print, you don't ever pixel peep on the print, or in the old days, we called it grain sniffing, right? Yeah. So, it's the viewing distance, mm. you know, it's, it's an image you try to get 
draw people in rather than expel them away. I can understand so, that. I mean, we, we often tend to be a bit influenced by camera club judges who insist, <laughs> who insist on pin sharp from right the way through an image to, to go well, up to the top. The, on, you know, honestly, um, I, use, I use all sorts of different cameras for different effects. But personally, I still go out with the, um, a 6 megapixel, 12 megapixel camera. You know why? Because for street photography, I don't need every stitch to be sharp. I'm an old school. I, I, I like the feel of film. So, but the, the only time when I use a 100 megapixel is when I need to photograph, um, you know, some embroidery, some painting where I need every single drop or a stitch to be sharp. Well, yeah. that's saying that, Danny, you've got a GFX 100, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> How many megapixels is that? 102. <laughs> so what, what do you use the GFX 100 for? Um, Look. Mainly used for copying work. Okay. But I mean, believe it or not, I mean, even with that, I still need to stitch it on some very large prints. But by the time when you print it, though, one to one life size, when you look at a print, you, you think you're looking at a real McCoy. Mm, yeah. I, I've Those are the some... times. Go ahead. Sorry, um, the... I was going to say, I've done some work for um, uh, the National Trust where they, they wanted a, um, a very, very detailed picture of a column uh, that was supporting an undercroft roof and they wanted it, you know, over time to see how it was degenerating, whether the roof was going to fall in. And I have to say that was a nightmare <laughs> because, you know, you're handling these files, which are then, you know, at the time, this was a few years ago, uh, then you had to stitch together. And of course it has to sort of change the perspective slightly so they all fit together properly. I never want to do that ever, ever, ever again. But I tell you what, though, you do, you know, if like me, I love challenges. Nothing is too difficult for me. Yeah, there's difficult and there's ball achingly boring. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, um, it's interesting that Pisa mentioned Topaz because um, I think that's a pretty hot topic on the forum at the moment. Everyone is looking at how Topaz is, is using AI to improve their their pictures and uh, um i suppose i'm a bit old-fashioned because I, I i like grain in my pictures a bit um and i think that i think many people here would agree that people do tend to obsess with getting rid of grain and making their pictures look rather plastic what, what, what's your view on that um i do print a lot of low res files um, you know, to A0 or beyond that at times. And the only way you can do it properly is by adding grain back in. Mm. So, but of course, it's the level of grain that you use. I mean, I, I, I do use DXO grains and I use part of it, not all of it. So it would, depending on the image, there's, not, there's never a one solution for everything. So it really got us got to see depending on what image and what outcome you, you need. But the, uh, the toe pass, I would say the, the gigapixel is uh, one of the best software that there is for, for making smaller images larger. But again, if the original image is already quite noisy, you first need to reduce the noise first before you upscale it. Yeah, actually the Topaz Denoise uh, software, AI, is absolutely brilliant. Uh, particularly for uh, Olympus uh, <laughs> images, <laughs> which, which can be a little bit noisy. Well, I tell you what, I mean, I've never had problem with noise, never. Because I'm, I'm actually quite used to it. Before all these plugged in, you know how I used to do it? 
I used to shoot film, zone seven, scan it in, and I used that overlay on, in Photoshop. That's how I used to get my grain. Real grains. Yeah. <laughs> by, by, by adding, adding grain, yeah. But um, even now, I still use, you know, add, adding grains. I make my own grain as well as using the DXO grain, depending on what's required. Basically, you, you change the grain structure depending on, on the need, yeah? I mean, that's a, that's a topic on its own. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have you back and we can, we can talk about a specific um, uh, topic in more depth. Um, one other thing which has been discussed recently on the forum is uh, film emulation. I, I, I know that's something which you're, you're interested in and you've done a lot of. Um, in, in fact, uh, referring to DxO, there was a comment that DxO's uh, film emulation, uh, uh, I can't remember who it was, but he considered that to be not very good compared to something else. And I'm, I can't remember what the other... Uh, well, I I've tried that, yeah. a lot. I mean, I, I do test a lot of different software. And the one I, I, I use most is DxO. Okay. Over, you know, over the um, the silver. What's it called? Um, Nick, Nick, Nick. Yeah, over, <laughs> over Nick. Um, over. Can I just are, stop, can I just stop you there, Danny? Somebody, I think somebody else was trying to say something. Was okay. Silver effects. Yeah, silver effect. Yeah, silver ethics. Okay. It, it was uh, it was me who um, posted something on. Film emulation. Ah, Robert. I, I I always liked the um, uh, the the look of the um, Kodak Portra film. That's it. Yeah, I've got a lot of Portra images which I've scanned, um, and I was trying to get away. Now I'm I'm not anywhere near as sophisticated. I think as many of you, I just use Lightroom and you know taking images on the camera and putting them into Lightroom in RAW and trying to get a consistent way of getting a portrait look. And um, so I, I've got the DxO um, software, and I just find that the portrait emulation is, is horrible. I mean, it, it, I said in my comment, it, it turns uh, you know, uh, pictures of you know, people's faces, it gives them a ruddy complexion. It doesn't give you that nice, you know, sort of slightly washed out, a uh, very subtle effect that Porsche would give you. And um, I was just wondering what Danny's comment would be on that. Well, try to try not to use the color um, grains. Instead, go to the black and white and use the black and white grains and, and check out the different formats on each film yeah. and, and learn to use only fraction of it, like 50%, 60% or whatever, to get your image right. Apart from that, obviously, it's also down to how you manipulate your colors. But the grain, you can just use black and white grain rather than the color grain. I find that the black and white film in the DxO is far superior than the color ones. Oh, that's interesting, because I, I thought that as well when I was... I, I quite like the black and white effects, but the colour ones... Yeah, hot. use the black and white on colour. Okay. Oh, interesting. Just just to select the grain, yeah. not the black and white effect. Okay. Because okay. you can actually just, just just use the, you know, the, the grain section, just yeah. select the black and white grain. Okay. So it, it sounds like the DxO film emulations are generally not bad at all, but that portrait one, uh, as it... As it stands, if you, if you don't do much adjustment, it is not to your, your personal satisfaction. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just um, looking at the time now. We've done um, an hour and 15 minutes. So it doesn't time fly. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> um, does anybody have any more questions? I, I mean, I, I, I was going to, I was going to have a, I was going to have a bit of fun talking about Danny's camera collection. Um, uh, but because I think apart from maybe Damien DeMolder, uh, the former editor and am amateur photographer, I think you have probably have more cameras uh, 
collected o o over the years than any anybody else. Uh, and uh, well, the reason why, um, you see, I, you know, it's, it's almost like a chemist, right? Um, I find I'm, I'm fascinated with different lenses on different bodies and the effect that I get from it. Um, I mean, say for instance, I was asked to photograph a little salted fish, just about less than two inches long. And, and I thought, wow, okay. That was a time when I had the um, A7R Mark II 42 megapixels, 19 millimeter G Master, that gotta be it. Set it all up, try to photograph it. And the, the depth of fill is like paper thin. Yeah. <laughs> and even I stopped down, I couldn't even get the depth of field. So I was scratching my head and I said, no, I'm not happy with this. And, um, and then, you know, this, the spark, this is a light bulb in my head. I said, right, okay. My Olympus Pen F have a, I think it's 80 megapixel. Um, what do you call that stitch? Oh, high res mode. High res mode. Yeah. And I put a 60 millimeter 2.8 and stopped down to around about 11. Then looked at the same thing again, pulled the two valves up on screen. It walked all over the Sony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the final picture end up printed eight foot wide what? and it looked amazing. <laughs> so that, that puts paid to the, to the, I don't know, the teasing that Olympus users get that uh, you can't make these big files. Uh, because... Well, that's why when, when people, I mean, I'm also, um, you know, I go onto the Facebook GFX group and they're talking about using GFX as a, as a macro camera. I said, don't waste your money. I said, get yourself a, an Olympus or a Panasonic because micro four thirds. Because, of the depth of field. Because, yeah. because the depth of field has to do with the, the circle of confusion, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's why on a large format, F8 is considered like a 2.8 for the 35 mil. Mm. And you won't have diffraction until you stop down to like past 64, F64, because well, the aperture is still large, basically. But, but back in the, um, in the plate camera days, they, they, I think there was some kind of... Um, uh, movement which was kind of complaining about the lack of depth of field in in cameras in those days because of the, the huge plate sizes and uh, um, the only way to get depth of field to stop stop down and of course that meant super long exposures and things like that so um, and, and, well, and uh, uh, no who, who was it it was uh, Edmund Terracopian was was saying that um, using using Olympus kit um, 16 megapixel EM1. He had no problem in getting exhibition prints done to A A0. So uh, if anyone's still anxious about that, you know, just just don't be. You can get a 60 40 inch with <laughs> with an OTEG. That that's 10 megapixels. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, look that picture behind me. That was shot on um, a Leica M8.2, 10 megapixels. Mm. And I can blow that up twice that size and still look just as nice. Yeah. yeah. Right? So honestly, it, people and talk about size. That's, that's why I make those prints to prove to people we have enough technology now with the, you know, apart from the very, very early digital cameras where they actually stored it onto a uh, disc. That, that was video, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, majority of them, if you go past like five, six megapixels, you can blow them to kingdom come. They will still look good these days. Viewing distance is one of the most important factors, isn't it? Because you're, you're not going to be looking at each individual speck of grain on the print. You're looking at the picture and that's what matters yeah yes yes I, it's the feel it's a feel that you're looking for yeah um i'm gonna have to bring it to an end for now uh but i'm gonna talk to danny about 
and, and, and to you guys on the forum. And maybe we can bring Danny back if, he, if he's interested and we can talk about some specific um, subjects which, which you guys would like to talk about. So if, there, if there's any, so, so basically I'll start a com conversation on, on the forum and if there's anything uh, uh, to do with printing or, or image processing using Photoshop, uh, which you guys would like to hear from Danny to, to talk about. Uh, maybe we could, do, <laughs> we could do some screen sharing and you, you can show Photoshop doing a few tricks and things like that. In um, the meantime, I probably can do a, a Photoshop, I throw a Photoshop action, you know, for the, uh, for the shadow layer that I'm talking about. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you can share it to the group and then, you know, they can try it out. In, in Photoshop. Yeah, that, that was great. Just to see, yeah, that would, uh, yeah, that would help, I think. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, th thank you all for, for being here, and I hope you enjoyed chatting to Danny, and uh, let, let's have Danny back in, in the future, and we'll, we'll talk about more, more specific things. Um, uh, so, We'll be revealing our next guest as soon as we know who it is. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, I hope that you're all well and staying safe. And uh, uh, it's just great to see you all from various parts of the world and, uh, and more locally. And I can even see yeah, my daughter there. there. <laughs> <laughs> She's online. So did somebody want to say something? No, I said it from down under as well. Excellent. Excellent. So we have Malaysia, we have Hong Kong, we have, we have Portsmouth. <laughs> yes. West Midlands. Excellent. That's great. Cambridge. Cambridge, yeah. Yeah, Worcester. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, obviously this current situation is, is deadly serious, you know, the, the virus and, it and, and everything, but I suppose it's a bit like wartime, you know, uh, we always see things happening uh, because people are forced into the situation and, and uh, you know, it, it's really pushed, pushed uh, what we're doing on, on, on the website uh, into a more communicative um, uh, period. And uh, I, I just hope that, that we keep this up after everything goes back to normal. I, re I really do. Well, wow. indeed. Let's hope that's going to be a new normal because from, from my perspective, I say this much, don't shoot me. Um, I think this COVID-19 is one of the biggest scam <laughs> going. That's another story. Obviously. Yeah, well, maybe we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> one, one of the things which, which uh, we won't have time to talk about, but, but, Danny is a bit of a philosopher, and he, he, he likes to look beyond what seems obvious. And uh, we, should have lot, we are, sometimes have long discussions about that. But sometimes some of the things, uh, I don't know, they, 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 they need a lot of, um, you need a lot of latitude to, to have conversations about. Well, that. basically, we are all consciousness yeah. being human. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And we are not human to begin with. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's, that's maybe a conversation for, an, for another time. <laughs> I, I, I'm <laughs> training for the priesthood. So, uh, yeah, we can have a good, good debate on that. Yeah, yeah. And, and Andy, Andy would definitely like to have a chat to you about that. And I, I, I know a few others, but this is not really photography anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that rich humanity yet either. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, guys. I'd like gonna, to I... say thank you to Ian and thank you to Danny for setting this up. I've uh, certainly enjoyed the last hour. Uh, oh, that, that's great. And, and thank, thanks, thanks to you, Andy, for being my backup. And uh, I forgot to put the recording on at the beginning, so hopefully you got the beginning <laughs> again. Anyway, I'll speak to you all soon and see you on the forum. Thanks a lot. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.